Hello, Fight fans. Welcome to the MMA Fight Corner. I am Heidi Fang, and I'm joined here by Joey Varner and Phil Devine. We are on Fox Sports 920 from the Las Vegas studios and worldwide on UFCRadio.com. Let's take a moment and thank Dr. Richard Rothman of LASIK of Nevada. Guys, in our last show, we had uh, Tom Lawler on the show. It was a great interview. That's available now on iTunes and also on our YouTube at the MMA Fight Corner. And we found out there was a possibility that Alexander Gustafson would be out of his fight. We walked you back through MMA history, but today we have UFC women's bantamweight Kat Zingano calling in. We're going to recap the Ultimate Fighter quarterfinals from last night and give you a breakdown on UFC on Fuel TV 9. Let's get started with the biggest, hottest topic going on right now in MMA. Swedish MMA Federation will not clear Alexander Gustafsson to fight. So we have Ilir, the sledgehammer Latifi, stepping in for the injured Gustafsson against Masasi. Guys? First of all, who the hell is this Swedish International Federation of screwing up cards? This is the biggest crock of crap I've ever heard. You know what? The cut looked bad at first, but from all accounts, from everything I heard associated with, is that the, the general consensus was that had he been cleared, it would have been perfect and ready by, by Friday. They said that there was only three stitches. It wasn't as bad as it made it out to be. And at the time, you know, it did look, uh, you know, rough. But then if it had been given the rest of the time to heal, that he would have been more than ready. It would have been a problem. It would have been jeopardized. So screw this federation of F-ups. All I know is the Swedish uh, Federation clearly has never heard of Crazy Glue. <laughs> really, really. Put, put a little Crazy Glue on it. Duct tape. Bang. They heard of Crazy, though, because <laughs> them doing this was crazy. Well, it was crazy, but you know what they did? I think, you know, they did a, the UFC found a suitable replacement for the Swedish fans. That, 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 that's the, the biggest thing that I've seen going on over the last few days. Uh, since Monday when the story broke, people were going nuts you know about the fight card being ruined dude it's a free fight card on fuel it is not a pay-per-view that we're worried about we're not trying to sell num you know sell buys it's a free fight card yes the people you need to worry about are the people in the audience that paid for the tickets that want to see a swedish superstar i'm with you a hundred percent okay but at the end of the day when you, when you go to bed thinking you're going to Disneyland and wake up realizing you're just going to the park around the corner, okay, your hopes are kind of shattered. You're kind of let down. You're feeling like, man, this kind of sucks. I was expecting Mickey Mouse and, 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 and Splash freaking Mountain, and now I get a, a splash in the water fountain and a slide down into a, in a cat box full of poop and sand. <laughs> you're running through the sprinkler in the yard. And yeah. Sand. <laughs> I mean, now the fight is, the fight, I, I think the card is still great. I think this is still going to be excited. I'm still hyped to see it. But, and I understand exactly what the promotion was doing because, Phil, you hit the nail on the head. You do have to look after the people who paid to get in. This is a Swedish card. They are a pro. This this crowd is pro. They're fighters. You know, you've seen from top to bottom. When their fighter enters the crowd, they have a Brazil-like response. You know, I think Brazil set the standard for crowds and how to how to get behind a local fighter. And they have that they have that that kind of support for their fighter. I mean, I mean, I remember watching the the Reza the Reza Madadi right. fight versus. Uh, Cristiano Marcelo, and you know he really won that fight rallying off the crowd the crowd was going nuts he was hyping him he was getting involved they were getting involved so they did need to you know they they did need to put someone in there that that the crowd could rally behind that could make the fans and attendance happy and that's what they did and I think the fight will still be awesome do you think that the, the Swedish Federation does have a good call being that where the laceration is it's in a very sensitive spot right above his eye in between the eyelid that it could cause permanent damage if he were to fight I, I don't think you can jump to a, you know, a, an assumption like that, like, oh, he's going to cause... I, I understand them wanting to do it, okay? We've seen this happen before, and, and Joey and I were talking before the show went on the air, which was, you know, we've seen this happen in for the good and for the bad. I mean, if you remember, Ken Shamrock was set to fight Kimbo Slice, and while working pads before the show, cut his eye. 
and had to be pulled for the fight. And, you know, 13 seconds later, Elite XC went down the tubes because <laughs> Seth Petrozelli knocked out Kimbo Slice. But, which, real quick, real quick, real quick, random little piece of secret behind-the-scenes information. Rumor has it that, that, that Ken didn't really accidentally cut his eye holding pads. Rumor has it that he, he at the last minute, tried to hold out and get more money out of them, thinking he'd play this card, that he got cut, and he would do it, and he did it himself. I had heard mm. that from Frank Shamrock, actually. I heard the same thing in an interview. Yeah, so just a little interesting, but, but, go on, but, but go on about the times that it pays off. But the, the time that it paid off, and, and what... What really sticks out is because the way that it, this matchup sets up with Musasi and Mr. Sledgehammer making his UFC debut, this re reminds me a lot of uh, Rick's story when he was on the rise and Nate Marquard, that whole issue that happened in Pennsylvania. W who steps in? Charlie, Charlie Brenneman, Brenneman and the upset of qu the year. And this is actually, Phil, that's a great point because this is actually such, this story is parallel with that. There's, it's so congruent. It's so similar because when you look at the, the style matchup in the kind of fight one fighter was preparing for and at the 11th hour to switch up and have a completely different opposite opponent, that Rick Story versus Charlie Brenneman fight is the same thing as Gustafson Musasi. Story was training for a well-rounded striker primarily in Nate Marquardt who Nate's, Nate, Nate uses wrestling but he's a striker. He's a stand-up fighter. He likes to stand and bang, and he gets a guy who's a pure wrestler at the 11th hour dropped on him. In this fight, Latif, Latifi, he's a Swedish national wrestling champion. He's an Abu Dhabi qualifier. He's a Greco guy. He's a wrestler first. Coming into this fight, he's a huge, huge underdog. I think uh, Musasi's a favorite by minus 2,000. Yep. He's an underdog plus 1,500. That means What that means, guys, is if you bet $100, you win $1,500. And what that means on the Musasi line is that you have to bet two thousand dollars just to win one hundred dollars now this has it's got it's can you smell that it I stinks it. of I an upset it. because <laughs> stylistically when you look at the losses of of, of musasi uh, you know won a draw against keith jardine which you know there was a point taken away for an upkick but it was also keith was able to take musasi down and, and control from the top position and you go back a little further and we have King Mo, who dominated him in utilizing his wrestling game. Dominated. So, Musasi coming into this fight, preparing for Alexander Gustafson, who's a pure striker, mm -hmm. who, you know, used some, a couple leg trips against Shogun, but he's not a wrestler. He's not a guy you spend your whole camp working on takedown defense counter wrestling guys. He's a work, he's, he's a fighter that you spend your camp training striking. You train to what you're going to do, how you're going to avoid the long punches and strikes, the knees, the clinch. And, and now at the 11th hour, he gets a pure wrestler. A guy who almost moves. You know who he reminds me of watching hit pads and moves? He reminds me of a, a poor man's Fedor. Just okay. the kind of way his body shape, the move, way he moves side to side and throws the kind of loopy punches. I mean, if you watch him hit pads, I watched the Fight Life documentary on him. I've seen a couple things. You know, in, in the ring moving, he just kind of has Fedor-esque movement qualities. But his whole goal at the end of the day is to use those strikes to change levels to get that takedown. And if you look at his fight against Tony Lopez... In the first round, he executes the most beautiful double leg takedown. It's reminiscent of Frank Shamrock versus Igor Zinoviev. He times a shot. He changes under it. He scoops the guy up in the air, picks him up, and slams him. That kind of takedown is the kind of takedown that if he uses against Musasi and if he can utilize that top control game, he'll win this fight. Yeah, I definitely see or smell upset in the air. And you got to think... Luffy hasn't really had a training camp for this. So you know that he's going to go to his basics, to what he really knows. Like, he hasn't had the, the, the camp that Musashi... He hasn't been preparing for a fight against Musashi, so he's going to go with what he knows, and that's his wrestling. And I think that's where he takes the fight. And and like, and, oh, go no, go ahead. Go ahead, Ike. Like you said, I mean, he did fight Tony Lopez. Tony Lopez naturally is a heavyweight. So this guy has that kind of power to do that kind of double leg on a guy that's over a bigger size than him. He's got more power than him, but yet he took him out. And then if you look at his record, he was 7-2 with one no contest. That one no contest that was his very first fight was because the ring broke. <laughs> And, and one of his losses to to Emmanuel Newton was a fight in which Emmanuel Newton, who just, by the way, won the Bellator tournament. So here we go. We do have a very competent, very tough fighter, a man that who actually knocked out King Mo, the guy that actually dethroned Musasi, just looking at the little the fight yeah. lineage there. But um, in his fight against Emmanuel Newton, what did he not do? 
He did not shoot for a takedown. He once, did not did wrestle. He? he tried. He at the third round, he tried to pin him against the cage and work from the cage, but he wasn't shooting at all. He tried to stand up and fight. So I think he made a mistake in that. And Phil, one thing you touched on was the fact that you know he hasn't been in a camp to fight Musashi, so he's going to go back to his basics. Well, what might pop into someone's mind is, well, if he's not going to be in, in a camp, is he in shape? Well, the thing is, is he was in camp for a fight four weeks away. He just wasn't in camp to fight Musashi. And you got to think of this. You got to think this. This guy's sitting at home. And by the way, April 1st, when this news, he, he wrote, he hit up UFC. He sent out a, he hit up on his website, he on his blog, he had a letter to Gegard Mousasi and the UFC. Oh. Just saying, Gegard, please, I respect you as a fighter. You're a classy man. I would love the opportunity to step in. I, you know, I want this fight. Please give it to me. And he went out there and he asked for this fight. And if you ask, you shall receive, right? And one of the things, too, also is he trains with Gustafson. And Madati. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. like he's been working with guys who were in a camp, and he's probably worked with Gustafson for Musasi. Absolutely. So uh, obviously he, without even knowing, he's got inside information. Absolutely. So it's it's definitely I smell upset in the air. Let's not take anything away from Musasi though. A top ten light heavyweight, one you know former Strike Force champ. K one, uh, not K one, but he was a dream champion. Musashi's K one really vet though. He beat, yeah. he beat, he beat, uh, uh, um, not Ma Masato. He beat uh, Musashi. Musashi, Musashi beat Musashi. Musashi. Yeah, 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 Musashi yeah, 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 beat okay. Musashi. I know right. <laughs> but, Say that three times fast. You know, Joey, when you said April 1st that Latifi wrote a letter on his blog asking for this fight, I thought you were actually going the direction of what happened with Vanderlei Silva. That jerk. <laughs> I think I think he has to pay penance for what he did. It wasn't April Fool's Day. It was April Trolls Day. He trolled yep. the whole <laughs> MMA community. He didn't but, get me, though. Yeah. I did not write that story. I tried to recall Vanderlei myself. I tried to confirm the information. I did not get that, and so as a responsible journalist, I decided not to just pay, cop copy paste and go off of other valid sources, mind you. The, you just say, okay, I, I got this story also. No, no, I, I, I was like, I don't have the confirmation myself. I haven't heard from anybody back about this. No way I'm running with the story. Turns out it was a good thing because it was, in fact, an April Fool's joke. And wow. but that, no, see, that's the thing is, is listen, I love Vandalay Silva. I respect him. You'd think that if he sits there and he t tweets, a fight's a fight. I'm taking the fight. You, 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 you well, here, assume quick, it's going to happen. Quick. So let's just recap, because I don't think we told everyone what the joke actually was. Yeah. Vanderlei Silva took to the Twitter campaign and let everyone know, hey, the boss man, Dana White, hit me up. Uh, I'm going to be fighting Gegard Mousasi. I'm filling in. And we all went nuts. I mean, geez, yeah. you think about I, I was excited about Mousasi versus Gustafson. I was 10 times juiced to see the axe murder coming at 205, coming off that devastating knockout of Bryant Stan mm -hmm. to step back in the main event position and, and take on Musasi. I thought, wow, this is going to be such dynamite. This is going to be so explosive. This is going to be so sick. This is going to be... Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> see, there's the difference between joking and taking something way too far. And the fact that Vandalay actually went about and called media and let him know let them know, I'm taking this fight, this fight's happening. That's, there's a difference between playing a joke and taking it a little too far. I think Vandalay took it too far. I'm not gonna hold it against him this time, but I do hold it against the media for running with the story. It was April Fool's. You never should have run with it. You see my well, friend. Guys. You see my friend. <laughs> you, you don't like my joke. I come for you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go ahead and take a break here. But when we come back, we're going to recap the Ultimate Fighter quarterfinals from last night. And we are on UFCRadioWorldwide.com and also on the Fox Sports 920 stations in Las Vegas. You're listening to MMA Fight Corner. The MMA Fight Corner.
MMA Fight Corner. Welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner. You're listening to us on Fox Sports 920 in Las Vegas and worldwide on UFCradio.com. I'm Heidi Fang, and I'm joined here with Joe Stradamus, Joey Varner, and <laughs> Filthy Phil Devine. Guys, uh, we had an awesome episode of The Ultimate Fighter last night. It's down to now the semifinals coming up here on the televised finale on FX. Let's talk a little bit about Josh Salmon versus Jimmy Quinlan and Uriah Hall versus Bubba McDaniel. Wow. That's the only thing I can say is wow when it comes to this season of The Ultimate Fighter and Uriah Hall. I mean, let, we'll get to Quinlan and, and Josh in a second, but let's talk about the main event of The Ultimate Fighter. Yeah, and yeah, that's the, main event. the main event <laughs> is Uriah it. Hall. <laughs> look, look at the reaction after his eight, and I repeat, eight-second knockout over Bubba. Did you see Carlos Condit? <laughs> like, dude. That guy is a monster. And you know Carlos Condit's been in there with the best of the best, so when he's looking at somebody like that, you know he's badass. Yeah, man, that was pretty pretty, uh, pretty devastating, uh, very eye-opening, jaw-dropping performance. <laughs> no but pun I gotta, intended. I, I got, yeah, eye-opening. <laughs> I got to be honest, man. There was a part of me that kind of questioned how hurt Bubba was and how much of it was that, that he just kind of he took the out because just watching that replay and then watching how he acted on the ground when he was on the ground he acted like he was unconscious what happened where am I you know but he didn't go limp like he was unconscious he got hit with the punch and then kind of try to change levels and he, he was still functioning he got a hold of a leg and Uriah sprawled out on him but he wasn't out it just seemed like he kind of just went limp and like almost like, you know, he was defeated when he came in the cage mm -hmm. and he had his out. He said, oh, he caught me good. Oh, my God, this is for real. I don't want to be in here. This is my out. It, it looked like that. And I don't want to doubt. I don't want to test his heart or question his heart. But just leading up to it, everything he was saying, how he was acting, the way his back was hurting, he was killing him. He couldn't do anything. Then the doctors say he's okay. Yep. And suddenly he's up shadow boxing with Uriah. He's perfect. There's nothing wrong with his movement at all. The back went away completely. He's healed. Like the, 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 the healer from the mountain came down, laid his hands upon him, took away his pain and said, let there be fight in you, my son. I'm God surprised. is amazing. <laughs> I'm surprised that when Jones went to Clint Hester and has him on the treadmill and Clint Hester's like, yeah, I'm ready to go if Bubba's not not going to be up to it, that that wasn't enough in itself to motivate Bubba, who needs this opportunity, from what I understand, with the way that his life has been and full of second chances. And, you know, he got the wild card over Clint. And yet here you are sulking around in a corner, not getting up to spar. And, and not only that, but I loved when the doctor came and he gave him the news. The reaction was, well, the doctor came in today and he gave me the results of my blood test. And they came back fantastic. <laughs> like, he was like, damn. Yeah. <laughs> damn. I'm yeah. so happy. So, but yeah, I, I kind of agree with you. And, and like you said, I don't want to take anything away from Bubba. But he seemed defeated before he walked in. I mean, he spent two weeks complaining about the fact that he had to, oh, at least two weeks of, of episodes, yeah. of shows. Two weeks of, of him complaining that he had to fight Uriah. And, you know, how many times did he say, dude, I, I put my I put three guys' names down. And why did they give me Uriah? Why, why'd they give me Uriah? He's the only guy that wasn't on my list. Well, you know what, dude? I don't think he was on anyone else's list. Yeah, right. <laughs> Nobody wanted to fight him. So I think, what, what did you expect? I think Clint Hester was game, though. I mean, I think he was yeah. game to fight him. But, you know, one thing about what's funny about John Jones approaching Clint Hester saying, get ready, I don't think Clint Hester would have fought. Because, remember, he lost. He's not in the tournament. He didn't win a wild card. The only reason Saman, or, or excuse me, um, uh, Bubba was fighting was because he won a wild card fight. He got the opportunity with the wild card fight. Clint didn't get that opportunity, so Clint is still technically out of the tournament. I think if Bubba wasn't going to be able to fight, then it would have been a, a, a like a, almost a you know forfeit. Yeah, and the uh, the other. Um wild card was Kevin Casey and you know you saw him he had to go to the hospital a few weeks before right. so there's no way he would have been and it, watching it's it's funny too because the two wild go card guys are the guys that seem to have quit yeah. mentally right. and, and which I think it, that that's a real shame because they were given that second chance and and uh, hey I don't know if it was editing you don't exactly know the situation I wasn't there but it just looks like the two guys that were given the wild card spot blew it with that yeah you know what too and, and i don't want to i don't want to 
you know, I, when we're saying about uh, Bubba possibly quitting and we're saying, you know, we don't want to question his heart. One thing, too, is I don't want to take away from Urias moment either because whether Bubba did quit or not, that was beautiful mixed martial arts striking. Uh, it, it was Anderson-esque timing. The knee, step off, the overhand right on the button. I mean, it was precise. It was precision. It was accuracy. It was laser focus. I mean, that was that was, that was was sharp striking right there. So I don't want to take anything away from him. But one thing also that really just, you know, this guy is such a... A conundrum. He's such a mystery, you know, because you hear a lot of, of people, you know, uh, Adam Sella and a lot of people on the show saying that he was hard to live with. He was, you know, he, you know, he's, Adam actually went out and called him a dick, yeah. um, you know, and you saw on the show how standoffish he was. But then, you know, he was so genuine after his fight and he sees this guy hurt like he didn't want to hurt him. He's like, I'm sorry. I, I didn't I didn't want to hurt you. I apologize for this. And he was sincere about it. It wasn't forced. It wasn't phony. You know, it came off came off as Authentic, and it's the same way, same thing he did with Adam Stella when he knocked him out. Like, you know, he was kind of excited. Then he, Sorry. then he, the, 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 the realization sets in. It dawns on him, wait, this guy could be hurt. And he comes over and he's like, hey, man, you know, are you okay? I'm so sorry. I didn't want to hurt you. So, so let's just count this then for the record twice. Uriah Hall has fought two people, both people sent to the hospital. Okay. Both of them fought three people. Right. You know, but I mean, two that people that were in the show. Decision. But to get in the house, though, yeah. but he wanted a decision. But that guy went to the hospital as well. He broke his arm. Oh, he did? Well, okay, oh, okay, see? See, I didn't know. Here we go. Right. Yeah. So three guys have been sent to the hospital. All right? Y you see the genuine concern after he does it. But the fact, and I'll tell you, me, I was watching the show. And I don't know if it's because of, you know, they... The way it's edited, but I, I didn't find I wasn't that interested in Bubba. I kind of found I was I wasn't digging his vibe throughout the season. He was almost right? bipolar, a and I kind of made a joke, um, you know, after while we were watching the show, and someone was like, uh, you know, I, I hope his head's in this, and I was like, I think his head's going to be in the front row when the fight's <laughs> over. But then the fight ends and the knockout happens, and you are genuinely you yourself, me. I felt bad. It was like I just watched a nasty knockout, but I don't care about that. I hope that guy's okay. That right. that doesn't. I think that's. When was the one time that that's happened to me? Chuck Liddell against Rashad Evans. Mm. I, re I remember when Rashad knocked him out. I was like, "Damn, look at him! Oh, he don't look like he's okay. Like, like stuff just got real." Was, <laughs> was there was there ever a time when I, there was a damn moment, but you didn't say, "I hope this guy's okay." Where you were kind of like, damn, good. You got what you deserved. You had it coming. Because there's a moment like that for me, and, 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 and it stands out so clear. Yeah, yeah. And it, it stemmed from a season of The Ultimate Fighter. Um, two coaches the whole time. One coach, Egan, the other one on. They finally fight. And the fight, guy who did the Egan on, the trash talking, gets knocked up out and i was like damn and i did not care whether he was okay or not and, that and that's fight, michael bisping michael bisping and dan henderson when dan hit the dropped the h bomb and the follow-up forearm bro i celebrated i celebrated the whole time i'm still celebrating today i'm still pissed off that when they show the replay of this fight uh on the ufc they pull out that last that last piece of uh, of elbow, you know, they only show the punch. They don't show the follow up forearm drop on them. They I never show that. that. They never show that. And actually, I watched that with about three thousand people in the in Radio City Music Hall. They had UFC 100 on a 75 foot screen. The first off, we were in Radio City Music Hall, nowhere near Las Vegas. Okay. The entire crowd chanting USA, USA throughout the entire fight. And then when Bisping got knocked out and Dan landed that other shot, everyone was cheering. Everyone was cheering. And Dan even said afterwards, yeah, I knew he was out, but I wanted to shut him up. <laughs> Do we have to get Uriah Hall a nickname at this point, like the mind eraser? I mean, he just invented, let's say, let's bring baseball into MMA because he just invented three strikes and you're out with Bubba. I mean, this guy needs some kind of a killer nickname. I mean, he even compared himself in his little vignette to Anderson Silva. Well, he's I already, like he's already that. Doing I it. like that no, comment, yeah. though, no, where he was like, you know, when Anderson Silva's in that cage and guys walk out and they're defeated before because they're like, damn, what's he going to do to me? <laughs> right. And, and I think that's what ha what's going on in the Ultimate Fighter house right now. I think there are guys who were looking at Uriah when they, they're matched up and they're like, this guy, I, how's he going to kill me today? There's one guy, one guy who's not thinking that. One guy who's not buying the hype. One guy who doesn't 
fear what he's going to do to him. Dylan Andrews? No. Uh, <laughs> Josh the man. Oh, Josh, well, Josh the man. Okay. Josh the man. And this is a fight that they both have been clamoring for. They both, day one, they did not like each other. They want to fight each other. They both think they're top dogs. They both don't buy the hype. And we've talked a lot about, about Uriah Hall ending all his fights in devastating fashion with first round knockouts and sending people to hospital. So has Josh. So has Josh. And Josh actually did it in the first, the fight to get in the house as well. So he's got three first round stoppages. Uriah has two. Uriah did say send all three guys to the hospital, but Josh has put away every single person in front of him. He did it last night, took out uh, Jimmy Kinlan in the first round, and, and he got, you know, he faced adversity. And I'll tell you what, it's rare for me to, when a fighter is on bottom, to give him the round. I mm -hmm. gave it to him. Oh, uh, yeah. I, because, he was so for, busy. But for me, though, it's, it's rare to do that because in the first place, you're somewhere you don't want to be. You have, the fight was dictated to you. You did not dictate the fight. This person took it to you, he put you where he wanted it to be, and he's controlling you there. And, and but, but in this instance, Jimmy Kimlin did have execute a beautiful takedown, a beautiful slam. He did take top position, but from bottom, Josh went to work. Josh was landing elbows. He was he was attempting submissions. He was transitioning. Every time Jimmy tried to pass his guard, he got back. And he, as Jimmy was trying to pass his guard and he was recovering his guard, he was making Jimmy pay. So up until the reversal and the stoppage, the fight took place with Josh Saman on his back, and I thought he was winning the round. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And uh, so at the end there, we did have the semifinal set up. Like you said, Uriah and uh, Josh both wanted each other, but I think Dana sees there the big picture of what the Ultimate Fighter finale could be. Dana and Josh, because Josh oh, yeah. said exactly. He said, "Hey, He's like, let's make this. this let's make this the biggest finale in the history of Ultimate Fighter. Uh, set it up so I fight this guy. Uh, I, I fight. I fight Kelvin. Uriah fights Dylan. We, we meet in the finals, and it's the biggest thing you have in the history. And I think yep. it is. And look at listen. It's at the Mandalay Bay." Right, And I think the UFC knew that when they put that fight together. They were like, hey, you know, we got Jorgensen and Uriah. I know the main event was supposed to be Moraga and, jo and John uh, Johnson. Demetrius, yeah. That didn't, didn't fall, uh, work out. Johnson got hurt. But, you know, I think, you know, based on – I know ratings are, have been up and down. But based on the season alone, the talent that's going to be walking into that cage at the Mandalay Bay next Saturday night, it, it's, it's top notch and it's going to be a great fight card. Even Chael said it. He said to Uriah right after that knockout that he fought in that middleweight division for years, and he thinks that Hall has the potential to be a future champion. So the semifinals are set. Josh Salmon versus Kelvin Gastelum, Uriah Hall versus Dylan Andrews. That will take place next Tuesday on FX at 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. When we come back, we hope to have an interview with UFC bantamweight Kat Zingano, who's fighting Misha Tate in the co-main event at the top finale here in Las Vegas, April 13th at the Mandalay Bay. You're listening to MMA Fight Corner on Fox 920 and UFCradio.com. MMA Fight Corner.
All right, welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner. I am Heidi Fang, and I'm joined here with Joey Varner and Phil Devine. Right now, guys, we'd like to take a minute to break down the UFC on Fuel TV 9 card for our audiences here in Las Vegas with Fox Sports Radio 920 and, of course, on UFCradio.com. We have seven, count them, seven Facebook fights coming up here on the Fuel card. Those are going to start really early in the morning on a Saturday. <laughs> That's going to be at uh, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. And also, guys, as promised, we are going to try to get Kat Zingano here on the phone very shortly. But let's dig into some of these fights here. We have the main event, of course, with Musasi versus Latifi. Uh, but one of, the, uh, car one of the fights that interests me most is the Riza Madadi, who's actually one of his training partners. Versus Michael Johnson. So, so what we're going to do actually is is we're going to start with the, we're going to do the undercard. We're going to do the main card on Friday, and we'll do the undercard today. So we'll start at the top, the main event of the undercard. And like you, like Heidi said, it is Razor Madadi taking on Michael Johnson. And we do have to start doing this more often because there's there's so many good fights. Not only on this card. I mean, let's let's be honest. The UFC model has has done it right. They don't do the boxing format where they have a main event and the rest of the that's all they sell it on. This whole fight card is good you got some really great fights and hey dude most of the time your knockout of the night submission of the night or even fight of the night or on the paper or on the pre prelim cards on a facebook you know card and this being fuel you've got seven facebook fights so there is no reason for anybody to not be watching this fight if you don't have if you don't have a facebook account by now uh, <laughs> just just stop just yeah. stop breathing it's <laughs> for free <laughs> Even if it's just to get the UFC fights. But, like, I mean, yeah, Michael Johnson against uh, Made is a great fight. Yeah, Reza Madadi, uh, he's, he's, he's a Swedish fighter, and he really rallies behind the crowd. He's, he's an Iranian-born Swedish fighter. He has a wrestling background, but he's worked on the strikes. couple notable wins. Uh, he, he took out Junie Browning, which, you know, <laughs> the infamous one. That should be Junie's nickname, the infamous one. He guillotined him. He took out Carlo Prater as well, uh, UFC vet and, and, you know, well vital fighter. Rich Clemente, he took out Rich Clemente. These are some big wins, you know, but a lot of these wins, they all took place in Sweden. Right. So he has that crowd, and he rallies against that with, with that crowd behind him, and we really saw that against uh, in, in the uh, Yoislandi Izquierdo fight. The uh, Yeah, what's up? You said that well. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, muchas gracias, señora. De nada. Uh, I, I want to say it again now. Yoslandi Izquierdo. <laughs> Otra vez. No, but, uh, you know, because it, it was a good back and forth fight, but he really rallied behind the crowd. He was hyping the crowd up. He was throwing his arms up. The crowd was going nuts. So I think he's one of these guys that the crowd will really play into to how he fights. Um, his next fight was a loss to Cristiano Marcelo, and this was more of a stand-up fight. It was a back and forth fight. I'm not really sure sold on his stand-up. I don't think his stand-up's the sharpest. It is the or, or the crispest. You know, and I, and I never sold on Mar Marcelo's stand-up. You know, even though he was at Shootbox, I don't think that he really trained any striking at Shootbox. He's the he only did. one, I think. He's the <laughs> only person that never wanted to strike at Shootbox, I think, because it looks like he's just, he's a, a rookie in the striking department. Well, who but, really? Who in their right mind wants to train, to train sparring at, at Shootbox? Well, think about it. When he was at Shootbox, you had Anderson, right? Anderson, Vanderlei, both Shogun and Ninja, uh, Cyborg, um, you know, you had some of the most devastating strikers in mixed martial arts on the planet today at one place in one roof. I don't think I'd want to strike there. I don't think I'd even want to walk in the door there. Yeah, and, and you know, you talk about the Christian fight, the Cristiano Marcelo loss. That was a questionable loss. I mean, it, it split, it split, it split decision, decision. And the, I think the only reason it became, you know, he got the loss is because of where the Brazil. fight took place. It took yeah. place in Brazil. I mean, and we've talked about the fight being in Sweden. He is Iranian-born, but he's lived in Sweden most of his life. He's a, a Greco-Roman and a Swedish freestyle, I mean, a freestyle and Greco-Roman champion in Sweden. Uh, you talk about his strikes. Never really stopped anyone with strikes. I think he's got one, but he does have seven submissions. And if you look at that, that has always been Michael Johnson's one flaw. All right, he's you know he's twelve and seven. Five of those losses are by submission. All right, he's um you know was the runner up on Tough Twelve. So you know, uh, tough dude. He looked real good. His, his those three fights leading into the Miles Jury fight, but the Miles Jury fight he's fought off his back the entire time. And he kind of looked like lost. I don't think he was ready, and neither were the fans. No, I wasn't. Were, I we don't. weren't ready to see Miles Jury do what he did. Miles Jury looked more impressive than he looked in any any fight 
up until that date. And Michael Johnson was the hands-on favorite, and for good reason. He was on a three-fight win streak, mm -hmm. defeating Shane Roller, the, the the beast Tony Ferguson, who was like the next big thing. He was knocking everyone out. And then he takes out last call, Danny, uh, Danny Castillo. I mean, those are three big wins in the division. He was riding a lot of steam. I don't think he was ready for Miles Jury. But uh, uh, Michael Johnson, he has a wrestling background as well. Yes. He came from wrestling as well. And I think of the two, I think he's the better wrestler of the two. And I think he's the better wrestler defensively. I think he has better counter wrestling than Reza has offensive wrestling. And I think his striking is light years ahead of Reza Madotti's. Now, there is one one question. And the question mark for me is the Black Zillion curse. The Black Zillions still haven't won a fight in the UFC in, in how long? All right. Uh, last I think, uh, no, December Abe, with Abel, Abel Trujillo. Abel yeah, Trujillo so, was the last one. So, you know, that that kind of always, I'm always questioning that. But, oh, wait, Belfort. But they have, yeah, Vitor Belfort, true. And yeah, Vitor Belfort's not only a Black Zillion, though. He's there for now. Vitor Belfort's the gypsy of mixed martial arts. Like, <laughs> he just kind of travels from camp to camp. You know, he's a travel salesman. He's a traveling fighter. He just goes to one camp to the next, you know. He's been with every camp in the last 10 years you can possibly think yeah. of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, from Black House to Machida's Couture. dad mm -hmm. to Couture's and now to Black Zillions and you go back further than that it, it's it's how he does it which is good I think it's very uh, I think it's necessary for the evolution of a mixed martial artist but but that being said um, the Black Zillions have struggled in the UFC of late but outside the UFC or their most recent fights they've had two huge wins Anthony Johnson taking out uh, uh, Andre Arlovsky and Tyrone Spong yeah. take, taking out Remy Bonjowski those are two <laughs> big 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 fights two big wins for the camp I think they're going to rally around this and uh, I, I like Michael Johnson a lot I think his striking is, is light years ahead of Madadis, and I think for Michael Johnson to win this fight, he's going to have to wrestle defensively, utilize that newfound footwork that we've seen in those last three wins, because he's really, he's changed in his last three fights, in his last three wins. He had this footwork where he's lying on his toes and he sticks and moves, and he'll have to use that with pr uh, pristine, crisp striking to keep away Reza Madadi and keep it on the feet, because if Reza can get in there and put him on his back, I think Reza will That's have the advantage. Definitely edge. Oh, another Swedish uh, fighter that we have coming up on the card. This season's Ultimate Fighter competitor, Tor Trong, is a Thor. Tor, I'm not exactly Tor sure. Tor Troing. Troing uh, versus Adam Sella. We have another Team Sonnen versus Team Jones matchup. Both both of them actually scored submissions to get into the house, but then they lost in the next round of elimination. Let's talk a little bit about that fight. Well, you know, you look at Tor, and yeah, he was KO'd by Josh Salmon, uh, Salmon, 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 Salmon. Um, I still I'll keep thinking salmon. of the fisherman thing, you know, <laughs> no, like. No, me too. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, he, he got knocked out by some but that was the only time that's happened in what he had 20 he has 21 pro fights 20 right. pro fights it's never happened before okay so uh, i don't know i'm not really it's tough to tell with these two because you didn't see their best i mean adam sella is a guy who the only thing we know about him is that he was part of the most devastating knockout on the history of tough and he was on the wrong side of it. Mm -hmm. So that's what we know about Adam Sella. But we do know that he's a 4-0 uh, as a professional. But if you look at the guys he's fought, he's fought no one. No one the caliber that, that tore the hammer has. It's, no it's not even that he's fought no one. Um, his his first fight, the guy's 0-3. His second fight, the guy's 2-1. His third fight, the guy's 0-3. And, and his fourth fight, the guy was like... 0-2, oh, I think. No, no, no. He was, he was 8-16. and 16. <laughs> Oh. So it was still... He's fought hey. guys that... Not, it's not that they're no one. He's fought guys who have no wins. You know, their winning records are just are non-existent. They haven't really beat anyone. So he's fought cans. He's fought guys that he looked great against. Now, uh, one thing, though, that he told us on the show was that his extensive boxing, amateur boxing, amateur kickboxing record. And that definitely, you know, uh, that definitely could play a role in this fight where he doesn't have the experience in mixed martial arts, but he has the martial arts experience. He has he the competition like, experience. He, he had like over 100 uh, amateur bouts, right? Yeah. Amateur boxing, kickboxing, fights. that's what he said. Um, you know, and a lot of them, though, were like gym smokers, but still, though, that that's still experience. Yeah. Now, you look back at the Uriah Hall fight, and up until the knockout, he did well. <laughs> Yes, he looked. He was holding his own. He wasn't winning or losing. It was a close fight up until he got caught. But at the end of the day, tour throwing, nineteen fights, fifteen and four. And you look at the guy he's fought. You know his his last fight. I think the guy was eleven and two. The fight before that was thirteen and four. The fight before that was twelve and one. He's fought contenders. He's fought the best of the best in Sweden. But here we go though. 
it's in Sweden. How is the European mixed martial arts scene compared to America? How is the guys he's been fighting over there, how do they hold up compared to, you know, the mixed martial arts in America? To the guy that Adam Sell has been fighting, you know, in his amateur boxing and kickboxing career. Are they on the level? You know, I mean, they fought a lot of guys, but the majority of the guys that he's fought and he's beat, all their fights have taken place in or around Sweden as well. So it's a tough to gauge. But one thing I'll tell you what, though, is we talk about the quote-unquote Brazil factor, because that's, that's what it should be called anywhere now, because they set the standards for crowd. Sweden has it. They rally behind their guys. That's why Tor was put on this card and Adam Seller, because he is a big draw. He's a local hero. The crowd will be in his favor. They will be rallying behind him. So it's going to be interesting to see. I, I, I think that you know they're both coming off knockout losses, so it plays in the back of both their Absolutely. minds. I think um, you know Tor could either use the crowd to motivate him or it could be a pressure it could be a burden it could be like damn i have to perform in front of all these people where adam sell he's coming in there carefree he knows that he's being brought in to lose mm -hmm. i mean not necessarily but that's the way he's got to look at it is like i have four fights this guy's got 20 fights you know i fought nobody he's fought studs they're he's they're he's on the posters he's the guy doing the radio circuits there they're bringing me in they're not bringing me in there to beat this guy they're bringing me in there to, to feed me to this guy you know he has to know that and that could take a lot of pressure off his shoulders. When, when you come into a situation where there's not a lot of expectations out of you, it's a great platform to shine. Absolutely. Absolutely. It definitely is. And, and, I mean, you talk about the guys that he's, he's faced as far as Tor is concerned. I mean, top, top competition. Hey, he, he lost to Tally's late tees, but he beat Mark Weir. Mark Weir was a professional from old school days of the UFC. Do you know that he actually still fights? Do, no. do you know what? You He's know like 46 the, years old and still <laughs> fights. You know the second coming of Mark, 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 uh, Mark Weir? It's no. funny because I, I saw this guy fight and I was like, this is, uh, oh my God, everyone's hyping around this guy. And I said, this is the second coming of Mark Weir. Um, who's the kid, Michael uh, Page? Yes. Uh -huh. He reminds me of the new Mark Weir. Like there's, <laughs> he does some flashy stuff. He's athletic, and there's all this hype. But you know, he's fought no one really, no wrestlers. And the minute he faces uh, uh, Philip Miller, wasn't that who, who Weir uh, was? It Philip Miller? Who was that? The wrestler that that took that had an awesome war, and then kind of just really was the start of the decline of Mark Weir. I, don't know, I, I mean, if you look if you look at Mark Weir's record, there there was a time like you know Matt Linlin, Gabriel Santos, he lost four in a row, five in a row. David Lewiza, Eugene Jackson, he beat in the UFC. Yeah, Philip Miller was the his that was the first loss wrestler, in the yeah. UFC, and then it was the decline. And you saw, you see after that. But to to think, dude, this guy last fought in February. He's forty five years old. Wow. Well, let's keep moving on down this card. We have another uh, fighter of Swedish background that actually trains out in one kick gyms here in uh, Las Vegas. That's Chris Spang. Phil, I know you're a huge fan of him, and he's going to face Adlan Amagov. Let's talk a little bit about Amagov's welterweight debut here against Spang, and both of them coming out of strike force. Well, it's funny. You talk about flashy, Joey. These two guys, they bring the flash. They bring the fun. Uh, Amagov making his UFC, and like you said, Heidi, his welterweight debut. He went 3-1 in strike force. His only loss was that uh, the one he actually happened here, Ricky Robbie Lawler. He, no, he lost to Oh, Robbie. Amagov. I'm, I'm yeah. thinking of Spain, yeah. yeah. Um, flying knee. Yeah, flying knee, and then followed it up. But he, he came back. He won a 40-second knockout in his next fight. Was that uh, the spinning uh, heel? The no, spinning no, that, hook kick? That, that was oh, old. Oh, okay. No, that he was actually, strike force, sorry. No, yeah. he I actually, mean, not strike force. Uh, Amagov actually made his name in it because of this devastating spinning yeah. tornado taekwondo kick. I love that Where kick. he knocked this guy out unconscious. It was beautiful. It was even more devastating and, 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 and high-level martial arts than what Uriah Hall did to knock out Adam Sella. And that clip started floating around the internet, and this guy just, he took off. There was so much steam. I think it's got a couple million hits. And, and one of the funny things is, is in that video, the guy gets, you know, spin wheel kick right in the face, but he buckles over like he got shot in the stomach. Like, he just drops, and his, like, ass is up in the air. Like, he's <laughs> brutal, brutal knockout. There's another clip of, of, of Amagov on the internet in one of his highlights where uh, he's throwing some punches. The guy tries to take him down, and he, he stuffs takedown and pushes the guy, and the guy, it's in a ring. So the guy hits the ropes and bounces forward, and as he bounces forward, he bounces into a head kick. So he hits the ropes, bounces <laughs> face first into a head kick, and then just timbers and goes out conscious. It was beautiful. Yeah, Amagov, definitely uh, exciting, dynamic striker. He trains with Winklejohn and, and Jackson, also splits time with the Miller boys over at AM, uh, um, what is that, AMA, AMA in, in Jersey. Uh, but Spang, man, originally from Sweden, he's got an old. This guy comes from a fighting family. His older brother's a fighter. His dad was a boxer. Um, let's let's get back. To this, let's get back to this. Finish this breakdown after the break. Yeah. Absolutely, guys. You are listening to MMA Fight Corner here on Fox Sports Radio in Las Vegas and on UFCRadio.com. The MMA Fight Corner.
definitely could. You know, the Connor we've talked about, he's got all of that hype behind him, brimage, you know, great stand-up fighter. Uh, hasn't lost since Iron Ring, dude. Do you remember Iron Ring? The BET reality <laughs> show. <laughs> It's who, who, are the, who are the rappers that were the coaches it was on that? Little Ludacris? Ludacris? No, Ludacris, Ludacris, Ludacris and Nelly. I didn't watch um, that. I don't, uh, gee, I don't know, but it was it was horrible. Cisco? Horrible. Horrible. <laughs> horrible idea for a reality series. Have rappers own teams of MMA fighters and put them against each other. But, hey, Brimage was on that. That was his only loss. He trains now with American Top Team. He's been on a roll. He's stopped those the the movement or the the climb of the ladder of a lot of potential fighters. Maximo Blanco had a lot of steam coming Jimmy in. Jimmy Hedis did. Jimmy Hedis had a lot of steam coming in. He's like taking on the role of the hype train derailer. Yeah, and I, and he's doing it well. He's doing it well. And uh, Connor, I don't think he. I don't think there's been a guy coming into the UFC with as much hype as Conor has in the last few years. And does the guy have nine knockouts or something? I think that's what I... He, uh, he's got I actually... Saw. I think he has 11 wins by knockout, but nine of them are in the, are first, in the first round. round. Right, okay. Okay, but remember what um, Marcus said to us the other day, that he sees... He, watching his fights, it looked like kind of like the Uriah Hall effect or the Anderson Silva, that Conor's opponents were defeated before they met him. They were afraid to fight him. Marcus mm-hmm. is not going to be afraid to fight him. Yeah, Marcus actually, he, he poses some unique uh, uh, challenges because of his style of striking. He is a southpaw, um, and a lot of times when two southpaws face each other, it can be difficult because they're used to fighting orthodox fighters. The same can go reverse. You know, when an orthodox fighter fights a southpaw, it's tough for them because they're used to fighting other orthodox fighters. So you flip that on its head, and two southpaw meet, and sometimes they don't have the same flow because they're used to fighting the other sided fighter. I say that ten times fast. <laughs> but Marcus Brimage, his last three fights has been against Southpaw. Yeah. So he's, he's had this training, he's had this experience, and that experience is lo- what he'll definitely want to carry over into this fight. But the way he strikes can be difficult because he's one of these guys, he kind of faints forward, faints forward, and then blitz blitzes forward. And it's it's his, the timing is rough to gauge. It's kind of awkward, you know. If you come forward, he steps back. If you come forward, he steps back. And then once you kind of stop, he fakes, 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 and explodes. And it's it's very difficult. It's it's an awkward style of striking, but an effective style of striking. But when styles when when, when they say styles make fights, and we're talking about striking styles, Connor's got a, a beautiful style of striking. He looks polished. And granted, he might not have fight faced the level of competition of guys who were you know who who were eager to get in there, bang with him. You know they. I think a lot of the guys did believe the hype, but I watched some of his fights. He fought some good strikers, guys who got in his face, guys who weren't respecting his power, guys who who brought the fight to them, and he faced adversity in those fights, and he rose against, he rose to the occasion, he took them out, he knocked them out in devastating fashion, and I think he really has this skill set here um, that's needed to deal with the, 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 the difficulties posed by the style of Marcus Brimage. Yeah, it should, should be interesting, because Brimage, although he's only had like se- seven pro fights, he hasn't been knocked out, or I haven't even seen him rocked yet so I'm, I'm interested in see how this fight takes place he he hasn't either though faced anyone at the level of striking strike that conor mcgregor has another thing to think about though is the the crowd factor is that it is in europe and as, as i've said many times europe's only 10 miles big mm-hmm. 10 miles long 10 miles wide so conor mcgregor in all his fights he packs the house he brings 90 percent of ireland with him he brings the whole damn country with him so you better believe that there's going to be a large irish contingency in the crowd that's going to be going nuts for conor well, let's move on here and talk a little bit about the Ultimate Fighter Smashes, Australia versus UK. Ben Benny Blanco Alloway facing Ryan LaFlair, who's undefeated. Uh, for Alloway, this will be his second UFC fight after Manny Rodriguez. He KO'd, KO'd him in the uh, finale there. And uh, LaFlair, he's been on a tear there. He's 7-0. You know, well, let me tell you, LaFlair, I met Ryan LaFlair a long time ago uh, right when he injured himself. Now, he, he made his, he's undefeated out of Long Island. He's got a good wrestling background. He was the Ring of Combat welterweight champion. And it's really funny if you go onto Ring of Combat website and you see their championship list, it's all guys that are in the UFC right now. Frankie Edgar. Uriah Hall. Uriah Hall. Chris so, Weidman. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's all guys that are, that are, have made their way to the UFC. So you know that the Ring of Fire, or Ring of Combat, they put on good shows. They have good fighters. LaFlair is undefeated, like we said. Uh, two and a half years, though, on the shelf. Two and a half years because of a shoulder injury. You know about shoulder inju- injuries, Joey. They're tough to come back from. He did come back in January, had his first fight, like I said, in two and a half years. But it was the first fight to ever go to the third round for him. Right. You know, so, um, you know, he's a tough dude. But I think wrestling's a strong point, And I think that's how he wins the fight against Alloway. But Alloway's striking 
was off the charts in his last fight. That Anderson Silva-esque front kick was just beautiful. So uh, it's going to be a fun fight. Yeah, Al- Alloway, uh, you know what? The thing that stands out to me in his last fight against Manny Rodriguez it wasn't so much the front kick because the front kick, it landed, but he wasn't trying to kick him in the face. He was throwing a teep to the body as Manny, Rodriguez, as Manny Rodriguez just happened to change levels for a double leg takedown. But what, what really stands out to me is the fact that Manny Rodriguez, a guy who's not a great wrestler, came out, took down Alloway, and controlled him for the top position for the majority of the fight. And then you got a guy like LaFlair who wrestled in college, he wrestled for Nassau, he's got a strong wrestling wrestling background, training with Dennis Bermudez at his gym there, training with the Black Zillions, you know. I think he's been wrestling with a lot higher level of competition, and I think that might be the difference maker in this fight. If Benny Alloway, Benny Blanco, not from the Bronx. <laughs> no, uh-uh. Uh, not from Benny, the Bronx. If Benny Blanco can keep it standing, I think he might have the advantage in the stand-up department, but LaFlair, watching his highlight films, watching the training footage, the way he, stri- he transitions from striking to wrestling is sharp, it's solid, his wrestling is good, his chain wrestling is solid, the way he links together his shots going transitioning from one takedown attempt to the next from the single leg to the double leg back to the single leg that is what I think will be the difference maker in this fight if Benny can keep it standing I think he's got a good chance of winning but if LaFlair can be effective with his wrestling he will dominate this fight well unfortunately we are out of time so we're gonna have to break down Tom Lawler versus Michael Kuyper and Bessa Musa versus Papi Abedi in our next show guys thank you so much for listening to the MMA Fight Corner unfortunately we were not able to get a hold of Cat Zangano, but maybe we can get her for the next show. She was filming for the she, old, uh, for the countdown she's show. She's a very busy lady with that co-main event coming up and being the second women's fight in the UFC, so we hope to get her on soon for you. Again, thank you for listening to the MMA Fight Corner here from the Fox Sports Studios 920 in Las Vegas and streaming worldwide on UFCradio.com. I'm Heidi Fang, and for the rest of the crew, Joey Varner and Phil Devine, thanks for listening. MMA Fight Corner.